Welcome to my free series of leadership and ritual facilitation videos. You can donate to help me offer more of these classes and write on these topics. There's more information in the video details below. All right, so my next question is about ritual rescue. Um, I know we should always have a backup plan when things go wonky. What are some, what are some of your go-to, mostly no-fail ways to get energy back on track? That's, it's a great question. And I mean, what I can say is that I, um, I don't always necessarily have a specific backup plan unless you're, unless you're talking about weather. So yeah, I, I can address weather as, as a specific kind of a backup plan. But um, when, usually when things go wrong, it's not the thing you can plan for, is in, in my experience. Um, and you know, a, a lot of it is just, for, for me, a lot of it is just being able to roll with it. And so here's, here's some examples. When I was doing my training at Diana's Grove, Diana's Grove was a retreat center, but it was also a dog rescue. These two things don't really go very well together. Uh, so we would be doing rituals and, you know, like a dog fight would break out during the middle of the ritual or a pack of hounds would run by or a beagle would get stuck under the decking of the, of the you know, the barn where we were doing ritual and we'd have to pry boards up to get the beagle out from under the, it, it, you know, it's stuff I can't even make up if I tried. It's, you know, just totally random stuff like that where you're, you know, you're trying to light your magic candle and it, and it won't light or, um, you know, there's just, there's, there's things that happen that you cannot necessarily always plan for. And so a lot of my training is around as around being an extemporaneous public speaker and just learning to quickly observe, okay, here's the thing that's happening. Watch it, figure out what's happening and, and find a transition thing to say that, that makes it okay. So here's, here's something, you know, with the, with the dog fight in, in, you know, when a dog fight breaks out in the middle of ritual, you know, there's really, what, what can you say other than, you know, everybody's going to, you know, take a step back away from the dogs and, and, you know, that that's going to become the thing that's happening. And so, you know, you just say, you know, it's, it's okay. I'm just, you know, and then people who are, in that case, there were people who were skilled with handling the dogs and they would break up the dogs and they would take them away. And so then, you know, whoever, whatever facilitator person is left in the aftermath of that, everybody's hearts are pounding and they, you know, they're all freaked out. So you just, you know, the, the go-to phrase I often use is, well, let's all just take a breath together. And let's just know that the dogs are being taken care of. Things are going as they need to. Everything's fine. Let's take another breath. So you get people kind of recentered, and you, you know, you know that the energy is not where it was. That's, that's obvious. But in this case, it's not something where you have to stop the whole ritual. You know, it's, it's being handled. And, you know, at that point, I might need an impromptu trans meditation kind of a thing just to transition people back into what we're doing and give everybody just a chance to recenter. It, it really depends on the circumstances of that. Um, I did the same exact thing. I had an altar uh, start on fire. I was doing a ritual in Memphis and uh, some, really, some really great folks in Memphis. I, I, I love those folks. They, um, they were fantastic hosts and, uh, and I unfortunately set, set fire to an altar in their, in their meeting hall. Um, but, so what, what happened was, oh, it was, it was a big fire. It was a big fire. Um, so what I did for that ritual, it was, in a, it was, a, it was a weekend, uh, it was a weekend event Four day, you know, four day event, and uh, there was this really big. Um, it was in a park district, forest preserve kind of place. So it was in you know, the main, the main area was this big, really, really huge room, vaulted ceilings, you know, tin roof, and um, so I had fantastic acoustics. And uh, we had about hundred people in the ritual, and I had them all, you know, close in in the center, you know, three, four rings of people. And then on the outer edge, I had these kind of altar shrine areas set up uh, where they were going to go and process around, and um, they were going to. Uh, uh, you know, do things at the different shrines at different altars and uh I, so i had preset that so that the altars already had little votive candles lit so each each altar had about um about i would say 20 to 30 votive candles big, big tables so 20 to 30 little votive candles and um but I, what i also had in the altars were small cauldrons for cauldron fires so if you're not familiar with cauldron fires it's actually it's, it's actually a pretty safe fire overall um so it's like a you know it cast iron is best and you fill it up with epsom salts and, and then rubbing alcohol and then you know you light it on fire and if it's a really small cauldron it'll go for maybe 10 maybe 20 minutes um so that's really good for a, a small part of a ritual so you, if that one's not going to burn through the whole ritual so i had preloaded the cauldrons on these different altars well what i didn't know is that i had a leaky cauldron so the alcohol is slowly leaking out one of the legs of the cauldron and soaking the fabric underneath with rubbing alcohol, it's often the fumes that ignite. And so what happened is when the rubbing alcohol spread out enough to go to where the votives were, it caught. So all that fabric was on fire. The cauldron was not. The cauldron was sitting above the fire and it was the fabric that was on fire. So I don't know how long that fire was going for a few minutes because everybody's back was to it. And I was in the middle of the, of the glom of people, you know, five deep. So I can't, I couldn't see it. And so then I'm about to get the group chanting to invite in. It was, a, it was you know, invite in the three deity archetypes that we were working with. And I hear fire, fire, the altar's on fire. And kind of the, the group parts to go look. And sure enough, the, you know, the altar is engulfed in flames. And um, you know, in a crisis, my blood pressure doesn't even go up. Like I just snap into focus. And so I just, I, you know, I walked over there. There were, there were, there were, I think it was two people that were trying to get the vote of candles off of the altar. And one person managed to get the, cause it wasn't really a super high fire. Uh, one person managed to get the cauldron off. And one person had gone to the kitchen and gotten salt, like a big, like a, like a food service sized box of salt, um, ostensibly to, to douse the fire is my, is my guess. Um, 
So she dumped the, the salts kind of on it, and, but it, it, you know, it wasn't enough to cover. And, but by the time I got over there, they had removed enough of the votive candles and they removed the, the cauldron. So all I did was I flipped the fabric up and just flumped it down once and twice, and then the fire was out. That's why alcohol fires are great, because it's, it's actually pretty easy to put those fires out, even if, you know, if they do occur. In fact, you know, a cauldron fire full of alcohol, you know, don't, don't try this at home, but you, you, know, you probably could, could dump it out on a carpet and it's you know, on fire, the alcohol's on fire, and you could probably dump it out on a carpet, and if you get to it within a minute, or well, let's say less than a minute, but if you get to it really fast, you can probably, you can probably douse it before it even burns the carpet. Um, I had four layers of fabric on that altar, and it only burned the top two layers. So you know, that's why you know, I, I use the alcohol fires, because they don't burn very hot, and they're, they're pretty, they don't really put off a lot of smoke. They're pretty easy to, to put out if you run into a fire emergency. But so here's how I handled um, the group's energy after that. So the fire is out, and so I, kn I know two things. One is that that altar is now different than it was, and I'm going to have to deal with that when it comes time to have people journey to the different altars. Because they, when the, what they were going to be doing is journeying to that altar to get pieces of red ribbon. Some of the red ribbons are now melted. <laughs> so I had to just kind of quick realize that I was going to need to talk to the two people who were attending that altar and just have a brief conversation with them before, um, you know, before they went over to do their thing. But, um, so that's, that's going on in my head. But the more immediate thing is that you know, I've got this room full of people that are... Oh my God, we just had an altar on fire. And so I just, you know, the, the group takes their cue from me if I'm the one facilitating the ritual. And so I just, I stepped back into the center and I, I laughed and I said, well, that's what I get for doing a triple fire ritual because we were inviting in three fire deities. And, uh, and so then I, um, I just, I said, let's all take a breath. <laughs> that's my go-to. And, uh, you know, I said some other transition-y stuff. And, you know, so I noticed everybody's kind of calming down a little bit. And so I, I said, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to invite in these, these archetypes of fire and we're going to sing that chant together. And, uh, you know, I think that fire is already here and already present, obviously, but, um, you know, let's sing this together to bring that energy here. And, you know, I tell you what, singing that chant really worked to, to get everybody back on the same energetic page and to take us back into the ritual. So there's, there's things like that that you can do. Um, you know, it, you, can't, you can't plan for things like that, but you can know that they're going to happen and, and get good at that transition language. That transition language is really, really crucial. Um, and it's also just, it's your energy as the facilitator. You know, if you are stressed out, that's going to telegraph. You know, we have pheromones, you know, we pick up on body language. That's just, that's, that's going to telegraph. So if, you're, if your body language is calm and, and you're, you know, and you're, you're like, all right, this, okay, so this is happening. So we're going to go over here and we're going to do this. People will follow, follow your energy. Um, as for contingency plans that you can plan for, so like the, the, the most obvious answer there is, is, or the most obvious problem you run into with those is, uh, is water in the, in the sense of, uh, of rain or storms or other weather. Um, and I've been to a few rituals where you know, we were, it was planned to be outside and uh, the, the, the weather unfortunately was not cooperating with us. And uh, you know, nothing, nothing kills a ritual faster than a rainstorm uh, starting to occur and everybody's getting rained on and they, you know, they run. So you know, if, if you're doing a ritual outside, you, pretty much, you always wanna have a, a contingency plan for what are we gonna do if it rains. Um, some venues, like like folks who do rituals in parks, there's you know if there's no shelter, there's you know pretty much your ritual is done unless unless it's you know people want to stay on the rain, uh, but pretty much your ritual is 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 done at that point. Um, if you if you are doing a ritual where there's like a shelter of some kind, you and you know the rain is kind of threatening, you can say you know if it starts to rain, we're gonna go go on over to the shelter and get in the shelter and then and then we'll kind of pick it back up from there. Um, you know, the, the, those are, you know, some of those are things that you can, you can start to plan for, but, um, you know, there's, I'm trying to think of other scenarios that, you know, I'm drawing a blank right at the moment. I don't know if you have any, um, do you have any, because you said, you said we should always have a back, back plan when things go wonky. Um, do you have any specific examples of wonky? <laughs> that, um, that, uh, well, wonky as in sometimes the energy raising just doesn't work, or if the area, even though it's been planned out, it's been on the books for, you know, months and months, the area just doesn't work out. Like there's a fire, there's a parade going by, you know, other things like that. And sometimes, you know, ritual assistants don't show up. Like the main piece could just be missing from the entire ritual. Things like that. Um, exterior, external interruptions, actually, it goes, that goes really well into uh, one of your other questions about hecklers and protesters. But we'll, we'll go with a slightly more benign example. So I did a ritual once in St. Louis, um, which, you know, finding indoor venues for rituals is always tricky. In this case, we were doing the ritual in uh, it, was, it was a place called the Ethical Society. So it's basically, I don't know if they, they identify as atheists or humanists, but it's, you know, it's not a church in the sense of it's not religious. Um, but they, they were open to a bunch of pagans running, you know, running the space, and it was inexpensive enough that we could do it. So we rented their big room, um, but they have other rooms available. And there was a wedding going on. I think it was a wedding. Some, some party was happening in, in one of the other rooms. Um, and they had rented a coca band. <laughs> 
So about the time, you know, we've, we've done our sacred space setup. We've called in the elements, cast a circle, done, you know, we've done a lot of the kind of introductory ritual stuff. And we are, everybody's relaxed and we're about to do a trance journey. People are laying on the ground with cloth over their faces, you know, to, to experience this trance journey. And, we've, you know, the volume's down, we brought the lights down. And then the polka music starts. <laughs> and like, you know, it's not overpoweringly loud, but it's presence. It's, it's, there's no mistaking that there's polka music pounding on the, on the you know, against the walls. And, and um, you know, my, my mentors were leading the trance journey and they, they said, um, it was, we were doing, it was a trance journey working with Psyche and Eros. And so they were kind of, they were in the middle of the induction of the trance taking us back, uh, back to the time of Psyche and Eros. That was the, that was the induction. And they, they said, and hearing the sounds and the songs and the music of all times crossing across all times in this place of the crossroads, in this place as we move between the world and we move between time. But they, whatever they say, you know, they, they just, they use the transition language. So there's, there's a technique. Um, whatever your ritual disaster is that's happening, uh, maybe it's just a dog barking incessantly, you know, and, and that dog is barking and your whole group, all they're thinking about is, oh my God, that dog is barking. Oh, that dog is barking. Oh, she must be so embarrassed. She's talking and that dog is barking. Whatever the distraction is, acknowledge it because acknowledging it allows people to forget about it. If you try and just ignore the distraction, that's all everybody's gonna be thinking about. And if you acknowledge it, you take away its power. So they, they managed to acknowledge it in a trancey way. You know, they didn't stop and say, well, there's vocal music, because that would have been really disruptive. But they acknowledged that there was this music and they were aware that this, there was this music. And can, you know, basically it was, can you let this music take you deeper into trance? And it worked, it worked very well. Um, you know, if a dog is barking, you can just say. So there's a dog barking. And uh, so we're just, you know, that's not, we don't have the power to change that. And so, um, you know, what I might do is invite everybody to come a little bit closer um, to make sure that they can hear me if they need to. And, uh, you know, I just acknowledge that it's happening. Um, I was leading, I was running a, a conference in St. Louis and the venue we had rented uh, was a very big echoey venue. It had concrete floors and, and metal ceilings. And their staff was moving chairs, like they had those big holy racks of, of event chairs. And so the chairs are all metal and the racks are metal and they're moving these down the hallways and the sound is just echoing off of the, off of the ceilings, ceiling. And um, so, what, uh, you know, I sent somebody out to go handle it, but it's, you know, if you just, I think at that point, I wasn't as skilled as a facilitator, and I don't, I don't know that I mentioned, or I, I, I tried to keep pushing through, thinking maybe the, the rumbling and crashing sound would stop, and it just kept going, and uh, now, you know, being who I am, I would have, I would have acknowledged it a lot faster, and, uh, and dispatched somebody to go <laughs> figure out what was going on, because it was quite loud. Um, my friend River Higginbotham, he's a, he's a pagan author, um, he, was, he was trying to lead a trance journey at Pagan Spirit Gathering once, and it was, it was after a rainstorm had happened, so um, one of the little pathways that some of the gravel had washed out. So the venue was, had, a, had a bulldozer and was re-graveling that particular path. He was trying to lead this gentle, quiet trance journey down by the creek. And, you know, there's this tractor <laughs> graveling right next to his workshop area. And uh, so, you know, I think he said something, you know, he was like, you know, he's, he was trying to talk over it. And, uh, you know, can you all just take a relaxing breath together? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's really, there's, there's stuff like this that you can, you can never plan for. I mean, if it's, if it's so loud that nobody's gonna be able to hear you, but it's gonna be brief, like if there's an airplane going overhead, I've had that happen at Pagan Primes, you know, you just acknowledge, let's just take a breath, take a moment, and then the sound passes and then you can resume. But if it's, if it's like, you know, you didn't realize that your ritual was gonna be, you know, that there's a parade going on in the, in, in the park and you're trying to do a ritual, nobody can hear you. Um, sometimes it is really just, you know, if nobody's gonna be able to hear you, it is best to just acknowledge, you know, no, we can't hear each other, so let's go move and find another spot or, you know, do something, something else like that. So it's, you know, again, there's stuff like that that you can't always plan for, um, but you can plan to know that things are, are going to happen. And um, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's, it's really rough. You know, if you rent a venue, one of the reasons you paid to rent that venue is the reasonable assumption that you're going to have the space you need and the privacy you need to do that ritual. And so it's really frustrating when things come up when it's like, and there's poker music or and there's parade or, you know, something like that. So you can't always plan for those things, but, um, you know, if you are not necessarily good at contingency planning, um, you know, getting somebody on your team who's good at contingency planning, there's people who are really good at contingency planning ahead of time. And then there's people who are really good at contingency planning, you know, on the spot, you know, kind of uh, the, the EMT, emergency medical, you know, tech kind of mind, like, okay, we're, you know, we're going to do this. <laughs> so, you know, figuring out where you're, where you're at with that is really good because if you're not necessarily good at the really quick contingency planning stuff, um, you can try and, and find somebody else who is and work with them. They may not be a good public speaker, but they may be really good at figuring out like, you know, here's what we do for this. So, um, but it, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's going, you know, things are going to get disrupted. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think the, the real key for me is, is thinking about some of those disruptions ahead of time so you can maybe have an idea of what those might be, but also just like if something happens, keeping yourself really calm because the group will follow your lead.
If you have any questions about ritual facilitation or leadership for pagan groups, please feel free to contact me. I love questions and I love writing articles or recording videos for actual issues that people are facing in the community. If this webinar is useful for you, please consider donating. It is my goal to make this education available for all, but to do that I have to pay the bills. I also have several books available, and there are links below under Show More, or you can contact me via my website or social media.